Hey everybody, Paul Rambley here. Good to be here. Um, so, a couple of things as we get started. Um, if you're watching a recording of this on my YouTube channel, just know that this is not the typical um, YouTube video that I make. Ninety-eight percent of the YouTube videos that I make, they're they're prepared in advance. They're fast-paced. There's no interaction with anyone. This is different. I'm excited to share a YouTube live presentation today. It will be recorded and YouTube will post it on the channel. But this is a way for me to be a little more laid back, a little more relaxed, present some information, and then have some interaction as we go along with you know all of you uh, people who are out there watching and participating. So um, good to have everybody here. Uh, the, the format... Um, I'm going to go through, and, and I really planned, kind of tentatively planned to make this last about 30 minutes. It might last longer. If there's really good questions in the chat, I'm, I can't just walk away from those. So uh, I don't have anything planned for 30 minutes from now. So if we need to go longer, we're, we'll go longer. We may even go a couple of minutes shorter, depends on how, you know, the pace of things. But um, I plan to present uh, about seven or eight different sections of information. And I'm gonna let you know what those are right now so that if you have a question, maybe it can wait until we're addressing that that question. And again, the, the theme here is the state planning for 2023. I'll let you in on a little secret. The state planning for 2023 is, is not that much different than a state planning for 2022 or 2020 or 2018. Yes, there are some differences. Things evolve over time. Tax rules vary somewhat from year to year, but uh, no, no really significant changes as we go into to 2023. All right. Um, so the the sec the what I plan to present, and I'll take a little break to check questions after each three or four minutes of presentation. Is I'm going to be talking about a, a hypothetical couple. If you're about my age, you may remember the Flintstones, Fred and Wilma Flintstone. I'll talk about Fred and Wilma. <clears throat> I may change up their their family situation a little bit, but you'll see as I go through it, I'm I'm going to do the same thing that I do with clients as we walk them through the estate planning process. Um, we talk. We really start with the end and then work backwards. So we'll we'll go through that scenario of what happens if Fred and Wilma uh, pass away at the same time or just what happens after both of them have passed away. Then we'll back up and talk about what happens when one of them passes away. We'll talk about what happens if they are alive, but they can't sign their name, deal with their assets themselves. We'll move into the, how do I protect my assets from the nursing home discussion? We'll move into the tax discussion. We'll move into the will versus trust versus avoid probate discussion. We'll talk about some technology advances going into 2023. So that just gives you a real quick overview of what we're going to do. Okay, so first of all, let me let me introduce myself. My name is Paul Rabelais, and actually I started a YouTube channel, I think about seven years ago. I've made 600 and something videos last time I checked. And uh, fortunate that I have over, last time I checked, 224,000 subscribers to my YouTube channel, over, it's been viewed over 18 million times. So a lot of people have viewed, have commented. Quite frankly, a lot of people who have viewed my YouTube videos have have contacted me directly to uh, to have to, to get those legal services to help them put their legal affairs in order. And in fact, um, since in, and I was born and raised in Louisiana, I, I went to LSU Law School. I have my master's degree in tax law from Boston University. I'm licensed to practice law in Louisiana. But about three years ago, it was like I was getting overwhelmed with people asking me from California, from New York, from Florida, from Georgia, uh, Paul, can you help me? You know, I've been watching your videos. You explain things in a way that's easy to understand. Can you help me? Can you help me and my wife? Can you help me and my husband get our legal affairs in order? I think we need a trust. I think we need a will. Can you help us? And for three, four years, I just had to tell everybody, no, can't help you. So um, not too long ago, a lot of work went into uh, the four lawyers who work with me, uh, myself and three others. We formed a, a national estate planning law firm called America's Estate Planning Lawyers. Uh, we have relationships with lawyers in all of the states across the country. So when someone does contact us from California, Georgia, Florida, New York, we can help them because we engage 
our co-counsel from that state who participates um, in the planning as well. So real excited now uh, to be able to offer these estate planning services to people all across the country. More on that later. Okay, so let's just get it right, get right into the to the nitty gritty. Um, first thing I'll do is is uh, jump it right in and, and talk about that hypothetical couple called you know Fred and w Wilma Winst uh, Fred, <laughs> Fred and Wilma Flintstone. So when when we first get started, we get past the hey how you doing, and it's like okay, let's find out if there's any specific concerns, Fred and Wilma, that you want to make sure you address as part of this overall estate planning conversation. And sometimes Fred and Wilma will just say, no, we want to get our affairs in order. We want to make things easy. Sometimes the Fred and Wilmas of the world will say, yes, we do have a particular concern. Our, uh, our, our son has these issues. Our daughter has these issues. Uh, and who knows what that might be. It might be someone can't handle money. It might be there There needs to be a certain person or couple of people that should be in charge of things in the future. But when somebody has a specific issue that needs addressing, we want to make sure at, at our law firm, April, that we really dig deep into that specific issue so that that person or that couple can have that peace of mind that, to know that everything's taken care of. So but let's just say Fred and Wilma say, you know what, we we don't know enough to know what our specific concerns will be. We'd like you to help us, you know, kind of guide us through the process. So, like I said earlier, I'll go through the okay, Fred and Wilma. So this allows us to to get where we need to be easier. So let's start with the end. And Fred and Wilma, if you if you both pass away at the same time, or quite frankly, if one of you passes away and then the survivor passes years later. After you're both gone, how do you want everything that you have to, to go you know, to, to those survivors? And a lot of married couples who have, let's say, three children will say, well, we want to treat each of our three children equally. A lot of different options here. Some people will say, well, I want to leave some specific things, maybe $50,000, maybe this car, maybe this home. I want to leave some specific things to specific people um, I'd say maybe a third of the people who put an estate plan in place make specific distributions. I want to leave this thing to this person, but I'd say more than half just say, we want to leave our estate to be divided equally among these people or to be divided in these proportions to these people. And it might be equally to the children. Let's say if, if Fred had children from a prior marriage and Wil Wilma had children from a prior marriage maybe they'll say, let's just treat all these kids equally. Maybe they'll say Fred's portion of the estate goes to Fred's children. Wilma's portion of the estate goes to Wilma's children. So we walk them through all of that. In addition, who are the heirs? We have to have some discussions about whether to leave things to heirs either outright because they're mature and responsible and they can handle it if a chunk is dumped in their laps uh, at once or should assets be left in a trust for heirs so that it's managed by someone else over a period of time and lots of different options there on those trust terms as to when, when that heir can benefit from the inheritance and when that heir can have certain control, controls. I'd say a kind of a combination of the um, let's leave it to them outright versus let's leave them it to them in trust has to do with, and as we move into 2023, 20, we see that um, you know divorces are kind of common. And so a lot of people uh, like to take that extra step of leaving things to the children or leaving things to the heirs in a way that it's, it's divorce proof for the children. So if Fred and Wilma leave their daughter a uh, million dollars, it goes into what I call after Fred and Wilma die, the, the daughter inheritance trust. And so that inheritance for daughter is, is, is secure in that trust and it won't get mixed up with other assets daughter may have with daughter's spouse. So if daughter later gets divorced, daughter keeps daughter's trust and then daughter and spouse split up other assets, assets that they may have acquired during their lifetime. Okay, so lots of options there on how an individual or a couple 
can leave things to the survivors after uh, after they pass away. Maybe the 2023 emphasis will probably see a lot more people um, take advantage of this, what I call making sure your children's inheritance is divorce proof options. So I'm going to take a quick break here. Uh, you know, I'm just going to look at some questions. Um, very first question that was asked days ago, Paul, if I may ask this question now, what documents my daughter shall request from the probate court as a potential heir of the opened probate of the estate? Good question. If someone's a participant in a probate, um, they can go to the courthouse. It depends on how far along the probate is, but they can typically see a copy of the will. If the probate is far along enough, they may be able to see a list of assets and debts of the person who passed away. Um, maybe there's some information that, that can be requested from the executor um, because the executor has certain responsibilities. So yes, you go to the public record at the courthouse, and if you can't get answers there, you often go to the executor to see if you can get those answers. The, the best probates are the ones where information is really transparent. Nothing's hidden. Everything's out there in the open. And so um, it, it alleviates, it, it prevents a lot of stress and difficulty. All right. Uh, let's see. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, can talk about IRS code 121. You're going to have to refresh my memory. Uh, 1031 rental, which is a like kind exchange. Um, I'm, I'm passing. I may come back to some of this at the end, but I really want to catch some of the kind of the state planning relevant to the 2023 issue. And I just can't get to every question today. Let's say I leave a dollar, a million dollars traditional to my adult daughter. How can she avoid? So uh, as, as I was going to go later when we got to taxes, we'll talk a little bit about the SECURE Act. I would say, Chris, hold on to that. Um, if a surviving spouse is receiving unit trust payments. So does that mean the surviving spouse is receiving, is, is a beneficiary of a charitable remainder unit trust and the family home is the only asset is the sale of the home for Stephen the spouse wants to stay in the home. Uh, don't know enough with what kind of trust and what kind of payments. Uh, that's a little, we need to ask you a lot more questions. Thanks. Dot notarized on our complete. So good. Uh, Z Goodwin talks about I'm a I'm a co-founder of a of a do-it-yourself self-directed platform called My Advocate. You can go to myadvocate.com uh, because there is a segment of people speaking about 2023 as technology takes over. Um, there's lots of different ways to do the estate planning. The traditional route is to hire lawyers like myself, hire law firms like Apple America's estate planning lawyers. And then there's other online resources, uh, one of which uh, I'm, I was one of three co-founders to create myadvocate.com. And I created that self-directed platform that you can go check out um, at your convenience. Okay. Uh, how can I remove son from my irrevocable trust? Uh, really good question, because an irrevocable trust generally means you can't change it, you can't revoke it, and you can't change it. I'm, I would wonder, and again, this is another one of those where I don't have enough information. Sometimes certain irrevocable trusts um, allow the, the settlor or the person who set up the irrevo irrevocable trust to alter certain things of it. So uh, I have this irrevocable trust, but within the irre irrevocable trust, I reserve the right to change this thing and that thing. So a uh, lot more information we need to know. Okay, moving on to the next part we talked about after you or you and your spouse pass away, important decisions on how you leave, thing, leave things to your survivors and then make that decision of who's going to be in charge of that when you pass away or when you and your spouse pass away. We'll get to the formal terms, executor, successor, trustee in a minute, but that's another one of those important decisions of who handles things when you pass away. Next is an often overlooked decision of how married couples leave things to each other when one of them passes away. I think most people just think that it's just understood or it's just required that if you got a married couple and one of them dies, just everything is supposed to go completely to the surviving spouse. So I'm going to introduce you to a couple of other options. We give all of our clients these options. So Fred and Wilma, uh, let's say Fred thinks he's going to die first because he's a little bit older than Wilma and he's a man. And statistically, 
um, you know, husbands just think they're going to die first. So let's say, let's go down that path, Fred. I'd say, Fred, you and Wilma have accumulated a, a $3 million estate. Uh, each of you has $1.5 million. Fred, let's talk about how you're going to leave your $1.5 million to Wilma because their, their big goal is that when one of them passes away, they want it all available for the surviving spouse. So I'm like, Fred, you, you got some options here. Um, so let's just say, Fred, you die first. How do you want to leave things for Wilma? One, do you want to leave it to her outright? Meaning, Fred, you die. Of course, Wilma will still have her $1.5 million. But Fred, if you leave your $1.5 million to Wilma, she'll own and control the entire $3 million. And uh, I don't really tell Fred this directly, but I'll tell my YouTube audience this directly. I would, I, In my mind, I'm thinking, uh, Fred, if you leave one point, your $1.5 million to Wilma and she has the $3 million, with one, uh, one stroke of a pen, either intentionally or influenced or otherwise, uh, Wilma could completely exclude the children so they get nothing. And so option two, Fred, is when you pass away. And this, this option two is really common. Wilma keeps her $1.5 million, but as to Fred's $1.5 million, Fred, your part goes into a trust for Wilma. Maybe Wilma's the trustee of that trust. And the trust says as to your $1.5 million, Fred, after you die, the trustee can make distributions to Wilma for her health, education, maintenance, and support called the HEM standard. That's so common, H-E-M-S. And then that trust says when Wilma dies, whatever's left in that Fred trust must go to Fred's children, whoever the beneficiaries were that Fred designated. So this second option is a way for Fred or Wilma, if Wilma dies first, it's a way for Fred to provide for Wilma, but Fred to have assurance that when Wilma later dies, what's left of Fred's part is going to go to Fred's desired heirs or beneficiaries. So um, real common for couples who have children from, from prior relationships, but also real common for the, I guess you call it traditional married couple, one marriage, children as a result of that one marriage, who want to protect the spouse, but also protect the children as well. So, uh, so anyway, there's, there's those real important decisions. And I, I feel like they're often overlooked in the estate planning process as to what happens when the first spouse dies. Time for a break. Let's see what we got here. Um, if child is trustee of their trust and there is a hymns clause, how do you ensure they only use it for hymns? Another good question. Um, if there are, um, if, if child is the trustee and the income beneficiary of that trust and there are hymns provisions um, that say that distributions can be made by the trustee to the income beneficiary for their health, education, maintenance, and support. And then when the child dies, the assets go to different principal beneficiaries then those different principal beneficiaries who are entitled to the trust assets when the child dies can hold that child accountable to make sure that the child only uses distributions for their hymns. So uh, again, depends on the documents, depends on how it's arranged. Uh, do you work out of Florida or for someone in another state? Yeah, as we mentioned earlier, um, we've, we've done work for people in Florida. We do uh, provide these uh, estate planning legal services for people all over the country. Um, we have a network of co-counsel. So if you're in Florida, you would contact us. You would probably speak with me on a Zoom call. Uh, our, my staff would get everything prepared and customized. More on this later. We'd bring our Florida co-counsel in to um, ensure state compliance with all the Florida rules. So, so yes, we're set up to, uh, to enable you to have several pairs of eyes, make sure everything's uh, good where we are. All right. So moving on. We talked about what happens after both spouses pass away. Then we just talked about what happens when the first spouse dies. Now let's cover during your lifetime, another kind of 2023 thing. Um, also, well, two, two points I want to make about 2023. Uh, people are having getting more and more digital assets, di digital accounts. People have their 
Facebook account. They have their other social media accounts. They have all kinds of apps. They have iPhones that have security features. So now in 2023, if you did your estate planning maybe 10, 15 years ago, probably didn't have any provisions about enabling your executor, enabling your successor trustee if you have a living trust, enabling your agent that you designate on your power of attorney. I'm about to talk about that in a second. Probably don't have, if you have a kind of old estate plan, you probably don't have any provisions uh, specifically allowing those people who will handle things for you in the future to handle your digital assets. So it's becoming a bigger deal now. Everybody has digital assets. You need to have the language in the documents. These companies, they want to see that you that your agent or executor or trustee has that express authority to handle digital assets. So that's something that, you know, if you started with us or really with, you know, kind of competent estate planning lawyers, it's it's routine now to include all that digital assets language in the estate planning legal documents. So getting to the um, who do you want to handle things if at some point during the rest of your lifetime, you can't sign your name, you can't sign on your accounts at the bank, you can't sign to sell a vehicle in your name. Virtually everybody who creates an estate plan addresses this issue. It's often addressed or almost always addressed with these um, depending upon what state you're in, if it's a if it's uh, designating someone to handle financial and business and property affairs for you, typically done through something called a durable power of attorney or general power of attorney or general durable power of attorney. If it's if it's setting the right people up to make healthcare, medical, deal with your doctors in the future, it's going to be called something like a healthcare power of attorney, an advanced healthcare directive. Um, there may be uh, e either in those instruments or in separate instruments, there's going to be what's my decision regarding if I'm a vegetable with no chance of recovery. The common term for it is those living will provisions. So all that is uh, is important and, and states are constantly revising their what's called statutory forms. Some states say, well, if you want to give somebody healthcare, the ability to make healthcare decisions for you. Our state has produced, our legislature has produced a advanced healthcare directive. And you can just fill that out. Of course, uh, wherever you are in the country, if you work with APLE, we already have programmed in all of that advanced, all of, all of the state specific forms, depending upon where you live. So all that gets taken care of. Okay. So that incapacity is part of it. Now the break, a little time out here. All right. Um, other than the thanks and the thanks and the love your YouTube channel, which is awesome. Um, how my mom can gift me her 1031 rental to me without paying capital gains tax. All right. That's a kind of sophisticated question, uh, but she can. Uh, hi, have you been trained in common law, which will be reinstated in the future? Have a lot of experience and I sure do. Uh, what is the difference between a revocable asset protection trust uh, you know, everybody has their own names for these kinds of trusts. Revocable asset protection trust, doesn't, not, not a name common to me. Usually if somebody is trying to, I guess, protect assets from lawsuits, it's some kind of irrevocable arrangement. Because if you put assets in a trust and you have the right to revoke that and put all those assets back in your name, a creditor could force you to do that. So uh, not really sure where you're getting that there. All right. Okay, next I want to go into the, the nursing home situation. And look, um, I, over the last 30 plus years, I've helped a lot of people arrange their legal affairs so that if they go into the nursing home in the future, um, they qualify for Medicaid. Um, this is by no means an in-depth discussion about Medicaid planning, but in general, when a, a single unmarried person goes into the nursing home, other than their house and their car, and, and there's other miscellaneous things, but in general, other than their house and their car, if they have an additional, other than those things, more than $2,000 of other assets, money in the bank, stock, uh, real estate that's not their home, they're just not going to qualify for the government Medicaid program to pay for the nursing home. They're just going to have to pay for it themselves. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I, 
I am not a fan of Medicaid planning. Um, and maybe it's because um, uh, people don't like to do it. They don't like to give up the control over over what they have in order to potentially qualify for long-term care Medicaid in the future, at least five years after they do all of this planning. And quite frankly, the, the care that people get when they do qualify for Medicaid is poor. And, um, and so uh, I, uh, I just like to see people work hard, save, accumulate, um, get the kind of care that they want and deserve, whether that care is in their home or in a facility. Don't rely on the government program that does provide some level of care to the indigent. So, and, and then maybe the last comment I'll say about why I just don't like Medicaid planning is because uh, if you ever are in a position where you have less than $2,000, you're in a nursing home and you need Medicaid to cover the cost of that care, especially if you've done some Medicaid planning in the past, moved assets around, put assets in children's names, put assets into special irrevocable trusts. You could talk to any one of, of 25 state Medicaid employees and they will give you 25 different interpretations of of whether based on what you did, whether you qualify for Medicaid or not. So I've, I've pulled out a lot of my hair, as you can see, in the past dealing with Medicaid uh, offices. I'm just not a fan of Medicaid. I did a video, you could find it on my channel, nine reasons not to engage in Medicaid planning. If you're thinking about trying to give away all of your assets and position yourself to, to get this uh, Medicaid Medicaid for the indigent, you might want to take a look at that video. So that's my that's my uh, Medicaid preaching. Time out here is Medicaid estate recovery sometimes pursued by, that's another thing. You, it's just kind of a crapshoot as to whether the state will actually pursue those Medicaid estate recovery rights where they can, after you die, um, uh, enforce their estate recovery rights, force your home to be sold so that Medicaid gets reimbursed for what they spent on you while you're on Medicaid. Sometimes they enforce it, sometimes they don't. All right, uh, advise to put your 4K or rollover into a trust. Okay, um, you can't, uh, while you're alive, put your 401K or your traditional IRA or your Roth IRA into a trust. Those have to be owned by individuals Sometimes the question that gets um, maybe asked incorrectly is, should I name a trust as the beneficiary of my 401k or IRA? And the answer, the lawyer answer is it depends, but maybe the better answer is uh, only if you need to. So for example, if you have a, a minor child or minor grandchild and you're leaving your IRA or 401k, which could be a million dollars to that child or grandchild, and they're young, you don't want to leave it directly to that minor. You want to name, make sure that a trust for the benefit of that minor is designated as a beneficiary. And so you may need to, to, to either create a trust for that or have that IRA, have you name your, your revocable living trust, which we haven't talked about yet, as the beneficiary of your IRA or 401k. Good question. All right, Coop, moving on. We're, we're trucking along here. Next, I want to talk about, uh, so my really moving into 2023 for Medicaid, I'm, I'm just uh, really would rather see people um, do what they have to do. For some, it's save. For some, it's get family members on board with the help. Um, uh, because so many people, they, they think they want to just snap their finger and get that protection. But once we talk about it for an hour, they're like, no way I'm going to do that. I don't want to give up control over my money. I don't want to put it in my kids' names. I don't want to lock it up in a trust where I can't get to it. So just uh, that, enough there. All right, moving into taxes for 2023. All right, um, I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff that, that isn't applicable to most, but good to have in case you're at a cocktail party. Um, some people, um, well, I want to talk about the linked or unified gift and estate tax structure. 
Let's start with the basics. It many years ago it was ten thousand dollars. In in 2023, it's going up from sixteen thousand dollars in 2022 to seventeen thousand dollars in 2023. You can, if you want to, give up to seventeen thousand dollars to as many people as you want to, children, grandchildren, non-related people, um, and not have to report that to the government. If you give someone more than seventeen thousand dollars in the calendar year of 2023, still no one pays any tax, but you do have to report that gift to the government. Government, because by making a gift in excess of seventeen thousand dollars, you are using up some of your for 2023 twelve point nine two million dollar estate tax exemption, which most people are never going to use because they don't have twelve point nine two million dollars. In fact, if you're a married couple and you set everything up right. Each spouse has their own $12.92 million exemption. So now we're looking at more than $25 million that married couples can exempt from the 40% federal estate tax. All right. Hey, our other, glad you stumbled upon the chat. Um, okay. So, but, but 2023 estate and gift tax planning, I would say is really more about preparing for 2026 if you've accumulated a little bit of wealth, if you're watching this now at the end of 2022 or during the year 2023, because you're watching the recording of this, then you're probably going to be around in 2026, three years from now, when our estate tax exemption gets cut in half. And so it's going to affect more people. It's still going to be a big number. Maybe somewhere around $7 million will be the exemption but uh, more people will be affected by the estate tax when it just automatically gets cut in half in 2026. Could Congress and the president change things? Yes, they could. But if they do nothing, the exemption gets cut in half on January 1, 2026. And then moving into 2023, we want to keep our eye on a couple of things. We want to keep an eye on whether Congress makes any changes to the step up in basis which is a real tax benefit when someone dies owning uh, appreciated assets. Yeah, you have to die to get the tax break, but it's really a tax break your heirs get. So if somebody bought stock for $10,000 many years ago, and now it's worth $100,000, if they sell it during their lifetime, there's $90,000 of capital gain. If they don't sell it and then they die with it, then the the uh, heirs will get a new basis. The basis will be the value on the date of the owner's or the deceased person's death. So if it's worth $100,000 when the person died, that's the new basis for the heirs. When they sell it, they'll only pay tax on the gain in excess of that $100,000 stepped up basis. We want to keep an eye on that. Always lots of you know, people talking about, are they going to eliminate the step up in basis? We also want to look at the, as a, as a commenter or chatter mentioned earlier, this SECURE Act where uh, reg, you know, new new laws have been enacted. Um, regulations have been written by the IRS. In general, the biggest component of the Secure Act is when you leave your traditional IRA or um, or you know uh, 401k uh, to a non-spouse beneficiary, um, they have to take all of that money out of that IRA within 10 years after your death. And of course, when they take that money out, they're going to owe, it's going to be ordinary income to them and they'll owe the income tax. Um, and, and, and so that rule change um, is going to, it does require non-spouse beneficiaries to pay tax at a much faster rate than in the old days when non-spouse beneficiaries could take required distributions over their life expectancy. So we're keeping an eye on that um, and seeing if anything changes there. Okay. Next, we're going to we've got just uh, maybe three more points, and then I'm going to go back to the chat and see what you got. Next, we're going to talk after we've gone through with Fred and Wilma. What do you want to happen after both of you die? How do you want to leave things to each other? Who's going to be in charge of making sure everything goes right when you pass away? Who's going to be in charge of handling your money and your business and your finances if at some point you can't handle it for yourself? Who's going to make all your medical decisions, get access to your medical records, talk to your doctors if you can't do it. Then, uh, and, and we rule out the, the getting, getting all the assets out of your name for nursing home purposes. We realize perhaps that the estate tax is not going to apply to you. The next conversation usually about is, all right, let's talk about the two different ways you can do all of this for your survivors. First, let's talk about the will plan. Second, let's talk about the living trust plan. 
And then what we what we tell people in 2022, moving into 2023, is the traditional way that people ain't arrange all of this is through their will. Fred and Wilma leave everything in their name, their home, their financial accounts. Fred and Wilma have wills or last will and testaments to provide how they leave things to each other, to their children, name executors. But when they do it the traditional way, when Fred dies, everything in his name is frozen. Now Wilma or Wilma and the kids are hiring lawyers like me because we've got to go through this probate process, which is required when you die with assets in your name, whether you have a will or not. And what most people don't like about the probate is it's a hassle, it's time consuming, and it's expensive. You've got lawyer fees, court fees, and just essentially lots of hoops to jump through because it's a lawyer and court involved process. So the alternative for Fred and Wilma would be to set up the Fred and Wilma Living Trust. And then the trust governs what happens when they die. Trust really replaces their will because they retitle what they have. Their home isn't titled in the name of Fred and Wilma. For the rest of their lifetime, their home will be titled Fred and Wilma as trustees of the Fred and Wilma Trust. Things that are in a trust when Fred and or Wilma die, they don't, they don't have to go through the probate. The government doesn't want to supervise the distribution of that. Fred and Wilma will name maybe an adult child or children as the trustees of their trust after Fred and Wilma pass away. Fred and Wilma will, Fred and Wilma will name beneficiaries of their living trust. So really the day Fred and Wilma die, if that successor trustee, maybe one of their children, decides let's, set, let's sell Fred and Wilma's house for sale sign goes in the day after Fred and Wilma pass away ready to sell immediately. They don't have to wait months or years to have that go through a court and lawyer uh, uh, involved process before uh, anyone would have an opportunity to access money or even sell real estate. Okay, so there's that analysis. And I'd say about, about 90% of the people incur the extra expense. Uh, yes, there is extra expense on the front end to set up that trust. There's retitling, a little more involved. But the savings on the back end both in time and money and hassle when each of Fred and Wilma passes away can be significant. Most people, when they, when they work with me, they're like, I just want to do whatever I need to do to, to make things as easy as I can for my spouse and for my children. And I don't want them locked up in a bunch of bureaucratic red tape, whatever I can do to make things easier for them. I'd like to do it. Okay, so um, moving into 2023 and uh, what, what has happened finally is technology has creeped into estate planning. So just as important, yes, uh, very, very few states allow for you know, digital signatures and DocuSign. Of, of, so still what we call wet signatures are, are used, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time because in most cases and in most states they're required. But still, there is a digital component to estate planning. Every one of our clients at America's Estate Planning Lawyers um, uh, has their own digital vault. And so as we're building the estate plan, the client is uploading information to their digital vault, family information, family names, asset information. We're uh, inputting information into that particular client's uh, digital vault. They have their own login and password credentials to get into their digital vault. Once all the estate documents are signed, they get uploaded to your own client portal or digital vault, and you'll have that digital vault forever. The beauty of it is when Fred dies and Wilma's like, oh gosh, I don't really know what we have. Click, click. Wilma sees everything that, that, uh, everything that Fred and Wilma own, how it's titled, uh, uh, with the click of a button, she can access, you know, PDFs of all of the estate documents, whether it's wills, trusts, powers of attorney. And then when Wilma passes away, whoever's handling things then, again, will have access to that online vault. It's a, it's a great way to save a lot of effort, confusion, hassle in the estate settlement process. And, and quite frankly, we get to see it as the estate planning lawyers so we can monitor things and sometimes we can see in that digital vault things that we wouldn't see if that vault wasn't there. And we can make a suggestion, hey, let's make sure, let's get this up to date. 
And uh, so it's a great thing. And so that's, that's as we move into 2023, um, you're going to see a lot more technology built into estate planning. All right. Um, one other quick comment, then I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the chat. Really good stuff. My last comment is this, this uh, YouTube live really was designed for me to give you value, you know, present information, answer questions. I have, a, I have several more questions in the chat for those of you who want to go to the next step, I would, uh, and, and, uh, see what it's like without incurring any legal expense, uh, see what it's like to start building an estate plan. I'd say either go to that link in the description below or go to our, our website, AEP lawyers, which stands for America's estate planning lawyers, AEP lawyers.com click on one of the links that takes you again. We like to use technology as much as we can. That takes you to a little intake questionnaire, takes you about a minute to fill out where you can request that a, a Zoom meeting with me. And in that questionnaire, you'll tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you're trying to accomplish. Our, our lawyers review that. And if it's appropriate for us to talk, we'll send you a link to my calendar where you can schedule a time at your convenience to have a Zoom call uh, with me to have that initial discussion during that discussion, we'll go through all these things we just talked about. We'll let you know what any legal expenses are if you want us to help help, help you get things in order. Uh, some of that information is on our website, aeplawyers.com, so you can check that out as well. So I do want to invite you because I know procrastination is one of the biggest obstacles of estate planning. So I just wanted to give you a little nudge there. So for those of you watching either live or watching the recording, you can go in the description or you can go to our website click on the link and then get yourself started there. Enough on that. Um, let me go back to a little chat here. We're going to spend the rest of the time um, addressing some of these questions in chat. I'm going to do my best and who knows what these questions are. Uh, let's see here. I'm scrolling up. Um, let's see. Delaware and South Dakota pre-mortem or pre-death trust notifying heirs. They have to raise their hand now. So you avoid. OK, so, yep, Delaware and South Dakota are a couple of those kind of advanced and and popular uh, trust venues. So good to see some information on that there. Would it be advisable to name trust as owner of an annuity? I would say most annuities, it's appropriate for the individual to be the owner. And if necessary, depending upon how you want that annuity money to go when you die, it may be appropriate to name one or more trusts as beneficiaries of the annuity. Some people who are trying to get their annuity out of their name for nursing home purposes will do some kind of change of ownership there, but that's not typical. All right. Stumbled upon. Good. I'm glad you stumbled upon it. Keep stumbling, uh, but don't hurt yourself. Uh, da, 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 where can online can I find language? Would surviving spouse lose a home if it has passed away with substantial hospital debt? You know, I, I don't know what the circumstances are here. Surviving uh, hospital debt. Uh, I've, I've dealt with a lot of surviving wives and surviving husbands. And, you know, husband dies and wife comes in and she's like, my husband had a heart attack. He was in intensive care for a week. He had seven surgeries. Um, I'm just afraid his medical expenses are going to wipe me out and I'm going to be left with nothing. Every circumstance is different, but more often than not, um, those surviving spouses are often, um, surprised to learn that, you know, if that husband was on Medicare, um, there's, there's, and, and I realize someone may have incurred personal liability for medical expenses or other debts. But um, just know that uh, the, the typical Medicare covers uh, and, and the supplements and all that covers, geez, uh, sometimes all of that expense. And so I would say it's common for people not to have that much um, medical expense debt, although for the third time, every situation is different. Any bit had my start to take over when I'm not around? Well, um, could be, Jeff. Um, I would say at a minimum, expose them to all of the information. So where you have problems is a, a father passes away and a son who's the successor trustee is like, man, I'm not really sure what dad 
had. And I'm afraid to finish the settling of this thing because we might uncover a new account, a new asset, something I didn't know he had. So the more information you can provide, either just uh, the old fashioned way, uh, make your list or the, the new technological way through your decision vault. And you can share all those credentials with your uh, successor trustee. And it's going to give them great peace of mind that they'll have what they need to get the job done. All right. Um, can a partnership interest in real estate be named into a trust? Yeah, partnership interest. Again, you have to look at the partnership uh, agreement to see if there's some reason. Typically, that's not the case why a partnership interest can't be owned by a trust. So again, so many of these answers are you have to look at the documents, the documents control. When you gift jewelry, furniture, et cetera, do you need to get it valued and does it add to the value of your estate for estate tax purposes? When you give away anything, jewelry, a piece of furniture, um, cash, write them a check, give them some stock, just because a jewelry and furniture is not titled doesn't mean it's exempt from all the gift and the state tax rules. So maybe that um, sums it up right there. How can we watch this again? Just hang on because uh, it's going to go onto my YouTube channel. It'll be recorded and then you can look it up uh, as one of the YouTube videos on my channel. Uh, Paul has, okay. Paul has numerous videos in his library addressing those complicated questions. Problem is you lose stepped up basis. Okay. If Fred has a will and IRA is in his name, but Wilma is the beneficiary, will the IRA need to go through probate? So yeah, an IRA is one of those non-probate assets. Fred has an IRA. Wilma is the beneficiary. Fred dies. Wilma gets Fred's death certificate. She gets that, that to the financial institution where the IRA is held. They do some paperwork and they move that into Wilma's IRA. No lawyers, no probate, no court orders required. Occasionally, an IRA will go through an estate when there's not a beneficiary or when the beneficiary is designated as my estate. Then you have some probate issues there. Uh, let's see. Pat did in May. I'm just good, 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 good. Okay. Um, IRAs go direct. Good. Okay. We're going to call it a wrap. This was awesome. A uh, few more questions here, but I am 46 minutes into it. Plan to be around 30. Uh, I plan to do this almost every Wednesday at 1.30 Central Time. I'll make an announcement on the community post to my YouTube page. Y'all have a great day and a great holiday. Look forward to next time. Y'all come on back. We'll see you next time.